Hi, dear students, dear parents, dear teachers. My name is Stefan Ramsdorf. I am professor of physics of the oceans at Potsdam University in Germany, and I would like to give you a short introduction to climate change. Let me start by a few words about myself. I studied physics and my first research work was studying the formation of galaxies in the early universe before I then switched to physical oceanography. And I went on a number of expeditions at sea and here you can see me taking some measurements in the South Pacific Ocean. Nowadays, I work in Earth system modeling and I'm head of the Department for Earth System Analysis at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. The climate of our planet Earth is the result of an energy balance. The energy that drives the climate system is coming from the sun. Some of that is reflected by the bright surfaces, the snow and ice surfaces and the clouds. The rest is absorbed and the Earth itself, like any physical body, radiates heat back into space depending on its temperature. And in this way, an energy balance arises, which is shown in this diagram. I won't go through the details, but in yellow you see the incoming solar radiation, and in the middle, in orange, you see the outgoing long-wave radiation, that is heat radiation. And this energy balance is uh, pretty well known. It's constantly observed by satellites at the top of the atmosphere and by a global radiation monitoring network at the Earth's surface with uh, many stations. And so we know uh, those numbers and we know how they are changing. If you look at the middle, you see this right arrow coming down. This is the so-called back radiation and that is the greenhouse effect without which the earth would be completely frozen and hostile to life. That is because greenhouse gases in our atmosphere intercept the long wave radiation that comes from the surface and they are sending it back to some extent and the long wave radiative heating at the surface there is about twice as large as the energy from the sun absorbed at the Earth's surface. So this is a really, really big effect. And as we will see, human activities are changing this effect. Um, and that is the reason for the climate changes in the modern times. But let's first uh, look at some natural climate variations. There are not many ways to change this global energy balance, but one of them is the changes in the Earth orbit. And uh, it has been known for almost a hundred years now that there are cycles of the Earth orbit in which the orbital parameters change. Um, for example, the orbit is sometimes perfectly round and sometimes a little bit more uh, elliptical. And these cycles are called Milankovitch cycles. And these uh, cycles of the Earth orbit, they make our planet move into ice ages and back out of them over the last uh, three million years uh, or so. And uh, what this map here shows is how the northern continents were covered by huge ice sheets at the height of the last ice age uh, 20,000 years ago. And uh, at that time, already modern humans uh, were living that were pretty much like us, and uh, they actually left behind, for example, these wonderful cave paintings. We understand the dynamics of these Ice Age cycles pretty well now, and in fact, at uh, my department at the Potsdam Institute, we run a model, that a climate model, that reproduces all the ice ages of the last three million years ago. At the right times, the Earth moves into an ice age and comes out of it again. Uh, you can see the continental ice masses grow in our computer simulation and shrink again, dancing in the rhythm of these orbital cycles. And um, yeah, we can reproduce these cycles uh, pretty well. And 
driven only by this, these orbital cycles. And we use the same climate model, of course, to study also future climate change. And so we have basically shown that it can uh, understand, we can understand past uh, climate changes with the same model that we use to look also ahead into the future. Here we see the, um, the most recent period in Earth history, the transition from the Ice Age into the Holocene. At the beginning of the Holocene, humanity developed agriculture, settled down in cities, and you can mark that as the beginning of human civilization. This diagram, by the way, is the fruit of decades of paleoclimate research, uh, drilling ice cores in Greenland, in Antarctica, in mountain glaciers, drilling sediment cores in the ocean, deep ocean sediments that allow us to reconstruct, uh, first of all, local temperature variations. But since we now have enough of those from many, many places around the globe, the global average uh, temperature change that you can see here. And you can see that uh, from the Ice Age uh, into the Holocene, we warmed the planet by about four degrees and that took about 10,000 years. Then there was a Holocene warm period in the mid-Holocene and after that we've had about 5,000 years of very slow cooling trend which would have most likely continued uh, somewhat further if we hadn't suddenly bent around this slow cooling and within a hundred years we have undone more than 5,000 years cooling and the uh, temperature of the earth is now warmer than any time in the human uh, history of human civilization. The fact that humans can actually affect climate, uh, that idea is not very new. The famous German explorer and scientist Alexander von Humboldt already in the year 1843 wrote that humans are changing the climate, quote, by cutting down forests and by releasing large amounts of steam and gas at the centers of industry. And since then, for more than 100 years, this issue has been uh, intensively studied in all its aspects. If we look at the change in temperature since the 19th century, this is what it looks like. You can see here that uh, in the black curve, a kind of standard way of uh, making a diagram of global temperature change. But in the background, you see these colored stripes and each color each stripe represents the global temperature of one year. And the blue ones are the cold years and the orange red ones are the warm years. And uh, I lived the first 20 years of my life only in these blue years, relatively cool global years. And uh, any 20 year old today would have lived their entire lives only in these orange red years. So that's exceptionally warm years. The reason for this warming trend, this modern warming trend, uh, is human activity. How do we know that? As I mentioned earlier, we understand the energy balance of our planet and we can only change the global temperature by changing this global energy balance. And we are monitoring these changes, we understand these changes, and that's how the United States National Climate Assessment, to just give one example uh, here, um, concluded that human activity are responsible for most, if not all, of the modern global warming, shown here since the year 1750. Uh, the red bar is the human influence and the two other bars, solar and volcanic. And you can see that these natural factors are not only very small, compared to the human influence in the last uh, 250 years, they're also slightly negative, that means slightly cooling. So natural climate changes in effect have counteracted a very small part of the human caused global warming. What are the consequences of that global warming? The thing that we probably feel first of all and foremost is an increase in extreme weather events. And this is a map of the famous heat wave in summer 2003 in Europe, just for one example. 
uh, heat extremes are obviously increasing due to global warming. That's a no-brainer, um, but we can also quantify that. Monthly heat records like the hottest August on record or the hottest uh, July on record, etc., are now occurring five times more often than they would do in a stable climate. That is simply an observational effect. We've done this uh, data analysis and one example is this European heat wave in 2003. This, by the way, caused 70,000 fatalities in Europe. So such heat waves, they are by no means harmless. They are silent killers. Another extreme that increases in frequency is rainfall extremes. We also have done a global analysis of rainfall data and they show a clear statistically significant increase in record-breaking daily rainfall events uh, since uh, 1990 about. This has become significant and there are simple physics behind that because warmer air can hold more moisture and also rain down more moisture from a saturated moisture saturated air mass. This photo is from the flooding in Texas after Hurricane Harvey dumped record-breaking amounts of rainfall on the United States. A third example is uh, the increase in drought in many regions of the earth and the associated increase in wildfire risk. Heat and drought both promote wildfires and this image is from the recent Australian wildfires and uh, a study by Stanford University that has just been published shows, for example, that for California, the number of days with the highest wildfire risk uh, has doubled in recent decades. A final impact of global warming is sea level rise. That also is very basic physics because the sea level rises in a warming climate First of all, because the ocean water warms up as well, and if you heat water, it expands a little bit, takes up more volume. And the second reason for the global sea level rise is that the continental ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica, as well as the mountain glaciers, are melting. They're losing mass, and that adds water to the global ocean. In the past, we have already seen a sea level rise uh, since the 18th, 19th century by about 20 centimeters. Before that, sea level was stable for at least 2,000 years. That's what sediment data tell us. And for the future, we expect sea level to rise for many, many centuries to come, even if we stop global warming, like in that blue scenario here for the future. Uh, that's one where global warming has been stopped below two degrees, but all that does to the sea level rise it, uh, is that it prevents the sea level from rising ever faster. Uh, it means that if we stabilize global temperature, sea level will continue rising at an approximately constant rate for many centuries to come as the ice gradually melts. If we allow further warming, like in that red scenario, then sea levels will start to rise faster and faster. I mentioned the Ice Age earlier on. When we moved out of the last Ice Age 20,000 years ago, global sea level rose by 120 meters. That's really massive, but that's mainly due to the melting of these huge continental ice sheets that I showed earlier. But we still have enough ice left on Earth to raise global sea levels by 65 meters. That means we can't afford to even lose a few percent of that global continental ice without drowning major cities. But we don't have to do that because the world finally in 2015 has agreed on stopping global warming. That's the Paris Climate Agreement where all nations on Earth agreed to stop global warming well below the two degrees Celsius uh, limit and to pursue efforts to try and limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. We're already at about 1.2 degrees global warming. So there's not much leeway left and that's why the problem has become so incredibly urgent. And one reason for that is also that we have lost decades of debating these negotiations. Uh, they have been going on for decades. And 
there are too many people that have been in denial about how urgent this problem is. But we can solve it, that is the good news. That's actually a good aspect of the fact that we are causing this problem. It means we can also solve it by transitioning to climate-friendly energies, for example, solar energy, wind energy. We can go 100% renewable energy around the world and uh, we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel burning to practically zero to stabilize the climate. But that is a problem that we can solve if we really want to. Want to. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. I want to point you to the fact that I'm also a part of the Real Climate uh, blogging team of climate scientists. You can follow me on social media or you could also read this book that was published by Cambridge University Press. Thank you very much for listening.